thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a distinct honor for myself as someone who started my space law career quite early to have an opportunity to share my journey and hope that it inspires you as well to get involved in space law as early as possible. So I'm going to be taking you through space law fundamentals, of course, focusing on development, sustainability and international implications. I will share this presentation and of course, John, with your permission, I will also share it online. But I also encourage you to take note that a lot of what I will say is not included in the presentation. So you might have to go back to the presentation to get the finer details as I give a broad overview via this current lecture. I also encourage you to ask questions at the end of the presentation, I'll be happy to answer. So without further ado, I will go into the agenda for the day. So uh, I will start, of course, with an introduction into, first of all, myself. I will go into what is space law. I will look into the stakeholders of space law. I'll look into sustainability of space law. And then I'll also look into the African space industry. I'll look into equitable access to space where I'll share opportunities with you to get involved as early career researchers. We'll go into Q&A and if there's some networking we can do at the end as well uh, for research purposes, we will do that as well. So if everyone is fine and ready, I will move right along. Right, so a little introduction about myself. My name is Rubin Samanga. I'm currently working as an analyst at Access Partnership. Access Partnership is a public policy firm currently specializing in tech consultancy, and I specialize in space and spectrum policy. My early career, I studied a Bachelor of Arts in Law. I majored in French, Spanish, and psychology. And then I went on to do an LLB with major in commercial law. So I did uh, contractual negotiations, alternative dispute resolution, uh, as well as moot court and uh, also notary and conveyancing. When it comes to my master's, I went into trade and investment law and I've been able to find an important link between the commercial and the space aspects in law. What are my interests? Well, when I'm not doing space law, I like to travel, I like to eat, I like to read, YouTube, gaming, everything really uh, that maybe you might not expect. Uh, but I am very much, uh, I think, a cool nerd. So not exactly just uh, all books. I do like to play a little. And then my current role and future interests, I work as an analyst, but I have many different roles. So I do have a startup that I'm hoping to see come through. I work in policy. I also work in uh, academia, of course, with research. And I work in outreach in trying to get local communities to better understand their role in outer space. And we'll speak more about that at the end. So I will move on now to space law. And I always feel very smart when I get to say this phrase, the corpus juris spatialis, which is the body of space law. And it has very four distinct areas of law, which I'll run th through very quickly. And I hope you will take the time to study in your further research. But I've also taken the liberty of highlighting, I think the most important principles that you need to look out for when it comes to space law. What I'm trying to do in this presentation, rather than give you the theory, which might bore us all, I want to give you a structure, a structure that will help you understand space law in the way that it, it is beginning to shape up. So what I present before you today is what we call four themes for space governance. That is the four areas of law that undoubtedly govern the different activities in outer space, which you might already be familiar with. Of course, we have the international law, which is quite straightforward. We have the five main space treaties, which off the top of my head, include the Outer Space Treaty, which is, I would say, the Magna Carta of outer space. It is the constitution of outer space from which all other space treaties and all agreements in general derive their meaning. And then we have Five, oh sorry, we have the liability convention, which of course looks at the extent to which actors may be responsible in outer space. We have the registration convention, which is the obligation on states to make sure that they are accountable for the objects that they put in outer space. We also have the moon agreement, which is quite straightforward. It's a specific agreement 
simply for the moon. And last but not least, we would have the rescue agreement, which ensures that if we are to send envoys to outer space, we're able to bring them back safely because they are representing all humankind and not just their countries. These are all binding, which means if they uh, sign to these treaties, their states are liable to abide by them. Pretty straightforward, so I won't spend too much time there. The non-binding treaties or the non-binding principles are very important as well. They touch elements such as telecommunications, responsibility. They're very unique areas that over the course of time, they realize that perhaps not only states are required to abide by space laws, but maybe some private actors might have some private industry interests. So I'd encourage you to have a look at them as well. Though they are not bright, uh, sorry, though they are not binding, they will have an impact on the application of space laws for other actors, other non-state actors. Not yet to have a lot of application in this sense, but still important regardless. We have the UN Charter as an important provision for international law, especially insofar as it regards the use of force. It's important to note that outer space is a peaceful domain or should be a peaceful domain. So to this extent, states should be cognizant of the non-nuclearization of outer space, the non-weaponization of outer space, as well as not using outer space to foment any kind of cyber interference or harmful interference with other states. So this is why we have the UN Charter, that is to manage the interests or the peaceful interests rather. The ICJ statute comes about as a result of the fact that most state disputes or most disputes that come from space will be between states. Why? Because in, in accordance with the corpus juris spatialis, states are the main actors in outer space. So at the end of the day, if we are to have cases in outer space, we would require a state to state approach. We are still inquiring to the viability of a state to private approach. And that is something we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is important for interpretation. This is because it brings into context the different ways in which we can interpret laws. Do we interpret them strictly? Do we interpret them according to national laws? Do we interpret them according to what states practice of their own accord? Or do we interpret them according to what private industry practices? Enough with international law, we'll move on to national law. I've highlighted there Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty because Article 6 mandates that states are responsible for the activities of all other organizations within their jurisdiction. So we all understand that the Outer Space Treaties came about as a result of the state-to-state -state conflict between the United States and Russia. But as activities continue to develop, there came the realization that not only are states involved in space, but also other stakeholders, which I will mention in further, but states still remain the main proponents for guiding these other entities towards sustainable activities in outer space. And I emphasize this point, especially for our point on sustainability. At the end of the day, Every initiative flowing from space law from the international level must be interpreted by the state in order to benefit its unique context in outer space. Let me move on to state practice. I mentioned here Article 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Article 32 says that when we are to consider cases or disputes in outer space, we need to look at what industry has done. This means that even if something hasn't been codified necessarily into law, we may need to consider it simply because a number of states have done it, a very influential state has done it, or for instance, we can accept that it's accepted practice. This is what state practice requires. So for instance, state practice at the moment is dictating that a lot of countries are beginning to commercialize space resources such as asteroid mining. I'll give you a few examples as we go along in the presentation. 
And then lastly, we have industry practice. And I write here miscellaneous because there are just too many for me to really go into detail on. But industry practice now is becoming, I would think, the most vital element for space governance. Why? Because industry is starting to exhibit what is known as tech diplomacy. For instance, Amazon. Amazon has become so large, right, that if it's to make an agreement, even with a country, and imagine a small country somewhere in an emerging region, it will exercise state-like powers because of how large it is. So we have no choice but to take into consideration its practices. It may not always necessarily be fair, and I need to understate that, especially in light of developments such as Starlink, but we have to understand that the more we have industry exercise influence, the more we have to consider how we're going to regulate that and to what extent that influence will dictate space governance or the corpus juris spatialis. This was the boring part and I hope uh, everything else after that is quite interesting. So we'll move on to stakeholders. I emphasize here that state, uh, sorry, space is a multi-stakeholder domain which represents the corresponding interests of all humankind. For this, I am specifically looking at Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, which provides that space is the province of all humankind, which means it does not belong to anyone in particular, it belongs to us all. This is further reiterated in the long-term sustainability guidelines, which I think are actually a very important document that doesn't get enough publicity as it should because it is the first international treaty that actually emphasizes that we have more than one stakeholder in space. We have more than states in space now. States, of course, are important, as I mentioned on the previous slide. They support decision-making at the multilateral level. So we need states to advocate for us. Then we have here NGE refers to non-governmental entities. Non-governmental entities concern two stakeholders. They are companies, private companies, as well as uh, non-governmental organizations, such as your research organizations, your outreach organizations, etc. What they serve to do, firstly, looking at companies, companies promote innovation. We know that with the funding that they have and the talent and the expertise, they're able to boost the, sorry, they're able to boost the way in which we can derive tangible benefits from space. With regards to the organizations, like grassroots organizations, they have more of a one-on-one -on -one contact with us, the local community, and are able to raise awareness, thus sharing with us how we can more easily benefit from outer space. I'll then move on to academia. I don't think academia needs too much description. It is the way in which we can build capacity through research and development, which I think is quite important. In a way, they help foment the activities or support the activities of states and non-governmental entities. And then lastly, and this one is very important and doesn't get enough recognition, I believe, is the role of the community is to legitimize space endeavor and also draw inspiration. What I mean by this is that for all of these other three sectors to work well, they need the support of the community. Without the support of the community, we found that many space programs have failed. This is the reason why it's taken so long for NASA to return to the moon. They did not have the requisite political will. So it's important that even if there is a lot of support for the first three sectors, the community still has the final say in determining why and when and how we should go back to space. I say this in the context, especially of indigenous communities, which have an underlying interest in our, interest, sorry, in our ex exposition to outer space. And I'll use the example of the moon recognizing that the moon also serves as a cultural or symbolic heritage for a lot of indigenous cultures. So maybe the idea of mining in outer space, colonizing the moon, et cetera, might not be so accept acceptable. 
But that dialogue is important to create a compromise between different stakeholders. And now I'll move on to sustainability. <clears throat> sustainability is a very important concept now for space law, not only in the sense that a lot of companies are developing their sustainability protocols, but also that here on earth, we need to be able to communicate amongst one another and to others the dangers that are presented if we do not remain sustainable. There is a concept known as the Kessler syndrome, which emphasizes that if a matter of debris or one piece of debris were to hit another piece of debris in another space object, it might create a domino effect so incomparable that at the end of all of this event, we would have a blanket of space debris around earth that would preclude us from launching, from operating satellites, from even going beyond moon and Mars, et cetera, and might even rain down as a meteor of space debris, potentially hazardous to life on earth. This is a reality that I don't think the ordinary citizen understands. That as much as you need space to withdraw from an ATM machine, to watch TV, to uh, access the internet, to use blockchain, et cetera, they also might not understand the real threat we face as people on earth if anything were to go wrong above our heads. So sustainability is becoming a key component and it's important to understand that sustainability is not only one broad concept. I haven't put it on the presentation at this very moment, but if you are interested in sustainability, you need to be able to categorize it into three different forms. First form, which is not highlighted on the presentation, is sustainability in its pure form. Sustainability refers to how can we continue using space for space and space for Earth? How can we continue using space for space means are we able to continue putting up satellites using the orbital resource, basically the economic, the socioeconomic functions of space? Can they still help us? And then when it comes to space for Earth, and this is something we often forget in sustainability, is to what extent can satellites or space applications help us manage our resources more sustainably on Earth? How can it help us live better on Earth? So that's sustainability in its core function. The other two is safety. Safety means the safety of the assets that we put in outer space. We know that everything runs on economic function as a basis. How do we ensure we can keep making money from outer space, if you're thinking as a state? And how can we ensure that we maintain our operations in space without, for instance, another satellite colliding with us. So that is more linked to space situational awareness. And then lastly, we have security, which is the backbone of really why we are engaging in space activities in the first place, which is national initiatives have national defense as a primary need for sovereignty, whether on earth or in space. So it's safe to say that a lot of countries want to be able to protect their integrity and their heritage. And space is an important domain for that, especially with regards to maintaining boundaries. So that was uh, the three elements of sustainability, but now I'll move into three elements that are not spoken about enough. So the three I gave you are really uh, more commonly known. Uh, the three I'm going to talk about now are the ones that maybe could use a little bit more discussion. They echo the same sentiments, but it's nice to think of them in the way that I've presented them as new thought leadership. So a little bit of safety has already been mentioned, which is how can we ensure that uh, traffic is managed and uh, satellites are able to orient themselves in orbit. Looking at industry practice, we see that there are a lot of technical mechanisms that have come in to support this. 
I myself am still trying to understand the technical, but I understand that it involves a lot of propulsion capabilities, which are to ensure that, first of all, when a satellite has come to the end of its life, sorry, its life, it is able to either orient itself to the Earth's orbit to burn up and disintegrate or to the graveyard orbit, which is not as sustainable, but can still fulfill a good purpose of cleaning up space. So in that way, we avoid any damage. How can we preserve the health? We need to start thinking of ways in which we can humanize space. You know, if you give space a personality, it makes it easier to preserve its integrity the same way we do here on Earth. You know, we say things like Mother Earth. We want to preserve Mother Earth. It makes us more cognizant of our need to take deliberate actions to preserve space. And unfortunately, there is not such terminology. We have very outdated terminology. For example, we're still using phrases such as manned expeditions, of which if you have a feminist outlook, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that all peoples now can take part in outer space. So how do we continue to preserve that integrity of space in a way that acknowledges its own value, as well as the value of all of the people that are contributing to it? And then lastly, viability, which is where youth have an outstanding contribution. Oh, sorry. An outstanding contribution is if we look at how can we ensure that not only this generation, but the next one is also able to benefit from space, but also contribute to it. I think one factor that we often overlook is the fact that one, we need to be able to still have a, a role to play in this next generation. I'll give an example when we get to Africa, but uh, the whole idea is when does the previous generation begin to hand over to us the tools, not only to understand sustainability, but to craft sustainability in a way that is very contextual to our current circumstances. All right. African space industry. Oh, sorry about that little caption. So I'll look at a little bit of the socio-political elements. I have taken the liberty to categorize into firstly, what is the regulatory framework? What are the governing institutions? And what are the main space industries or subsector, sub oh, sorry, subsectors that we're involved in? I'll start, of course, with the African space policy and strategy. So, of course, the policy highlights what are our broad themes, and the strategy highlights the ways in which we will implement them. The African space policy, and I think as many that have been replicated before, emphasizes a desire to build capacity. I will then bring in a little fact, especially owing to the last point I made on the last slide, which is the role that especially youth can play or future generations. An interesting fact is, did you know that the average age currently in Africa is 19.6 years? This means that by 2050, one in four members of the population will be African. And this means that any future forward company or organization willing to stay relevant will have to in some way factor in a policy for not only addressing youth concerns, but also African concerns as a major market. Most recently, there was the signing of what's called the African Free Continental Trade Agreement, which is essentially the largest trade agreement brought into existence since the World Bank. And what it does is it basically breaks down the borders between the 55 African countries and creates a market worth $3.4 trillion. That is unprecedented. Of course, it will take a lot of our policy innovation and implementation to see through, but this undoubtedly makes Africa the future space market and future trade market of the world. So looking forwardly, it's important that people engage themselves with the African space policy and strategy and align accordingly, not only so much as to boost this market, but I think to benefit as well. Africa has long had abundant resources, which I don't think it's afraid to share. 
but it's important that international partners continue to engage in a mutually reciprocal way. Further on, looking at the institutions, as of 2022, we now have an African Space Agency, which looks to model the same structure as the European Space Agency by bringing together the 55 states and providing a platform for regional integration. The administrative as well as the financial obligations have been concluded. That is, all states are now aware of what they need to contribute fiscally in order to participate. As well, it has been determined who will lead and organize this wing. With regards to the specific areas that they will be focusing on of interest should be astronomy, which is a new and developing sector in Africa, Earth observation, which I will discuss separately below as our largest market segment, upstream capabilities or manufacturing, which is the extent to which we're able to develop a local industry for components, etc. And last but not least, research and development. So academia, once again, is a very vital component of any space program. The African Space Agency is being mandated through the African Union's Outer Space Program. So a very important division, which also supports the extension of many other programs, including Earth Observation that I will discuss now. So I will run through this for purposes of information, but we have the upstream applications and the downstream. Upstream, refers to uh, manufacturing or rather the components that go into space activity and downstream refers rather to the tangible output we get from space exploration. So upstream examples would be uh, rockets, would be uh, space components, antennas and ground stations. And then the downstream would be all of the different data uses we would have from a combination of these. So the research outputs, the earth observation data, the satellite imagery, et cetera. So this is Africa's largest market, earth observation. It's about 60% and it's not by chance. Africa has a host of developmental challenges which are quite obvious, whether that's the need for water resource management, where there's the need for uh, taking advantage of all of the agricultural inputs and arable land that we have, the resource development as well. And uh, also if we're looking at the humanitarian crises that we have, all of these play a role in having the eyes in the sky. So that's 60% of our market and only about 17% is the upstream capabilities. So we're only starting to develop that now. But between you and I, I will say that we are looking towards an upsurge in upstream capabilities. And I'll give a very interesting fact in this regard. One of the upstream capabilities that Africa is hoping to specialize in is the development of space ports. Okay. And what makes this very interesting is we know that Cape Canaveral in uh, Florida has been dominated, of course, by Starlink and many other launch services. But did you know that Starlink can only launch from Cape Canaveral 52 times a year? But if we had only one spaceport in Africa, we would have the opportunity to launch twice or three times that much in a year. Not only because we have a geographical advantage, but also the number of countries that would have that advantage. So the reason why Africa really comes up when it comes to spaceports is that the closer you are to the equator, the more favorable it is for you to launch your rocket, owing just to the geograph sorry the uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth makes it more efficient from the equator. There are thirteen countries on the equator, and of those thirteen, seven of them are in Africa. So it places us in a very good. Uh, vantage point. And it's safe to say there are about five developing initiatives so far for spaceports. We will see how those come about. But I'll certainly say if you're looking for the startup hub or the space industry hub for Africa, I would point you towards uh, Kenya. Kenya has had very good capabilities, especially in agri-tech. And as well, they are developing, I think, the more robust policy provisions for 
business environment in space. South Africa has long also held, I think, many firsts for Africa. They provide a very good standard on how space and space policy can be divide, uh, diversified for different sectors. What I mean by that is, I'll take you back to the first slide where under Article 6, nations are supposed to come up with policies to regulate other entities. South Africa has done a very good job of catering for every single entity, is what I mean to say, as well as catering for every other diversified sector. So they have something for earth observation, for communications, for electronic communications, they've got something developing for blockchain, and that's what a healthy space industry should have, ETC. Right. Now we go to equitable access to space. This is quite interesting. And uh, for this, I'll mention that uh, I will put you in touch with a good colleague of mine who will be able to assist you further with, I think, a Greek perspective on, first of all, starting your career and also furthering it in the international space with your particular context. But what I mean to do with this slide is to give you more tangible prospects of furthering your career. You have had the immense privilege of having this course, uh, but I myself did not. So all of these organizations are institutions that I was affiliated with that gave me an opportunity to learn practically, to research, and also to make money. And I'll also uh, share those in turn. So in terms of professional network, here I am referring to if you want a space where you can meet other industry professionals to link you to job prospects, to help you gain skills, et cetera. First of all, I'll start with the Space Generation Advisory Council. The national point of uh, contact whom you might know is a good friend of mine, uh, Nicholas uh, Moraitis. He would be happy to support if you would like integration to this organization. And there are different subsectors or themes that you can get involved in depending on your interests, space sustainability, the economics of outer space, et cetera. There's something for everyone. There's also a space law and policy project group. And um, it's a voluntary and free organization that you can take part in and take part in national activities within your country. Also, there is the Women in Aerospace chapter, which also acknowledges that only 10% of the astronauts that have gone to space are women. So we do emphasize that there should be capacity building and inclusiveness and diversity. There is a Women in Aerospace Europe chapter, which is easily accessible online. I'd encourage you to have a look at that. When it comes to outreach, so if you're like me and you enjoy taking part in community service and voluntary activities, there's the World Space uh, Week Association. What they do is every year from the 4th to the 10th of October, they have a week of just celebrating space and they have national activities, international ones as well. But aside from that, they continuously share resources that help you learn a bit more about outer space. Space is technical, but they share information in a way that makes you feel uh, welcome. And then there's also For All Moonkind. Uh, like myself, I'm very interested in moon policy. So if you're interested in not only learning more about how the law pertains to the moon. For All Moonkind actually has a number of scholarships for you to study an advanced master's in space law. And I think that that master's program at the University of Mississippi in the US is a very reputable program. I'd really encourage you. And then for research, and this is perhaps what might be interesting, uh, if you'd like to make a little bit of money as well for the work that you're doing as well as growing, there's a very nice foundation called the Open Lunar Foundation. They have an open call for fellowships all throughout the year. You can apply. They have a very competitive salary um, for you to apply some research as well as network. You will have to work on moon policy, but it's very interesting and it opens you up to a connection of space lawyers from around the world. For broader knowledge, on space law in general, the Secure World Foundation provides a good basis of understanding what are the fundamental principles, perhaps the ones that we weren't able to really get to in this presentation. But what do you really need to understand about the law before you go into deeper research? So without further ado, I think that will bring us to the end of this presentation. Um, I will now allow you to ask me any questions and we'll take it from there.
Thank you very much, uh, Ruvimbo. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, especially uh, the parts uh, on which uh, you analyzed the sustainability aspects of uh, outer space. And um, maybe if I suggest to take a five minute break before any questions, is that okay for you? That's okay. perfect. Thank you. Okay. Let's take a five minute break and then uh, we're here again. Um, is there anyone that would like to uh, ask any question to Ms. Samanga on what uh, she just uh, presented to us? Okay, maybe there's a hesitation, so maybe I could start. Um, it's very important to, uh, to connect uh, sustainability development goals with uh, outer space. And uh, maybe uh, it is not uh, a matter of uh, sustainability as such. However, it has uh, a development uh, aspect. And it's very important to see how SDGs are connected uh, to outer space. Um, according to your experience and according to your uh, working I mean, experience, uh, are there any... Uh, things that you would like to mention um, regarding this uh, connection between the SDGs and uh, outer space? Certainly. Uh, I think I'll mention three. I can't quite track the source of this anymore. I'm still trying to find it, but of the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, one minute. Sorry, and unfortunately, the person who gave me the call is a family member. I can't be upset. I'd like to thank you again uh, uh, for this uh, effort to deliver this uh, lecture. Uh, uh, flu. It's all right. Thank you so much. I wanted to say um, of the 17 SDGs, 13 of them can be tracked using satellites, which means we need satellites to actually monitor and evaluate the SDGs. I'll have to confirm that source as soon as I do, uh, I will let you know. But this shows us that space and satellite applications are what we call in my field of trade and investment, a critical investment, meaning that they have socioeconomic impact in space. So that's the first link. We need space to help us manage life sustainably. They are the eyes in the sky to broader see the impact that our life here has and our different activities have. So that's one link. Also, if I'm to look at uh, SDG 8, which is the role of the private sector in promoting uh, sort of equality, diversification and economic impact, space is creating a lot of opportunity for private individuals, for research, for states to grow in their national sovereignty. And it's promoting socioeconomic development. So that's another link that we can look at, which are the tangible, economic benefits of space, which as you know, space is a very lucrative career. When you engage even in the legal industry, I will say from a personal perspective, the money that I have made as a researcher in the industry is far beyond competitive in say other industries. So there's that. And then lastly, there's also talks of engaging uh, a next SDG, an 18th SDG, which is space as an SDG itself. And I think that's something that deserves a lot of research, noting that space is beginning to hinge on almost every sector of human life, whether that's civil, academia, uh, sorry, academia national sovereignty, uh, which relates to defense, et cetera. So it's having its role to play in a wide variety of sectors that maybe it deserves its own recognition. With regards to, I think, um, 
Africa as an emerging market, it certainly has a role to play in boosting the way that we are able to manage existing resources. Uh, whether that is three things, it is our borders, our resources, or our people. For Africa, it is a major component for sustainability, so we need to look at that. For other countries, it may be one or two. It could be borders, it could be resources, it could be uh, the people. But for Africa, it's all three. So it's highly, highly critical, and in that extent, we need to look at sustainability. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in addition, I have one more question. Um, if I'm correct, uh, back in uh, 2019, uh, you launched a service uh, called uh, AgriSpace. Maybe it's an application. Uh, could you please uh, tell us more about this uh, initiative? Certainly. Uh, so Africa, we're very blessed with a lot of arable land. And uh, unfortunately, though, for instance, where I come from, we are exposed to drought, a lot of drought. We're in high drought areas. For instance, here in Southern Africa, we have what's called the El Nino drought period, which is a persistent drought that we experience in almost uh, 19 countries in Southern Africa. So it's important for us to manage what is in essence the climate change related to doing agriculture in our region. So AgriSpace was uh, an invention of mine that brought together, I think, core elements that I had not seen before in agri-tech, which is firstly the desire to share tech knowledge with the community, that is one. Secondly, a desire to support government initiatives. So we are a policy innovation in that we look at what government is trying to achieve and we align ourselves with them. Thirdly, is equipping the farmers with the technology that they need. So not only explaining to them how this tech can help, but then actually providing them with that technology. Fourthly is understanding that climate change has a lot to do with the reason for us introducing this technology. So we factor in climate change, education, equipment, and resources to support the farmers. And lastly, inclusion of international partners to help us gain better understanding of agri-tech and integrated systems. For this, we look at countries such as Israel, as you know, which have very highly automated irrigation systems where, you know, with AI and in this age of AI, you can literally automate from your phone, you know, the temperature, the uh, moisture, as well as the fertilizer and feeding that comes into a system so that it's more efficient, it's more effective, etc. So AgriSpace, we were fortunate to be third place winners in the Africa Earth Observation Challenge, which is, I think, the premier competition for Earth Observation in Africa. For this, we won three in-kind prizes, which were firstly, and I mentioned these so that uh, to gain a broader understanding of what's required for at least a prototype for startups, we gained Amazon Web Service credits. These web service credits are important, of course, for building our website so that we want a situation where we don't have to be there in person all the time. Uh, and then also we won a satellite imagery from Maxar, which is a big provider in Africa, but of course many providers exist. I would personally also opt into the likes of Planet, etc. Many others, Ice Eye is also coming up. And then lastly, we also received a media publication, which for international partnerships and funding, it's very important to have that visibility. No seed funding as yet, which is what we're currently working on. But if you're looking to startups, uh, the easiest thing to do is get funding. The hardest thing to do is to create a prototype. Creating a prototype means uh, creating a tangible version of what your solution is and showing that it actually works and it has popularity. In our case, it would be, can we develop an app where an everyday farmer can log in, get information, and that actually helps him? If we can prove that, funding is the easy bit. So that's uh, where AgriSpace is at the moment. I certainly hope that as we continue to integrate, we will see more uptake of farmers knowing when to plant, how to plant, and where to plant based on their crops, and that this will make an impact for them. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, endeavor and uh, we wish you to uh, have the results uh, that uh, you want.
Um, Ms. Lekaki has a question. Yes, thank you. Mr. Uvimbo, given your experience in space law, I would uh, really like to hear your opinion on uh, the following matter. How do you see space in future? Do you see a peaceful environment that benefits humanity overall? Or do you see entities, more, more uh, private entities, taking advantage of the state's disagreements in order to make more money for the few and wealthy and less good for all humanity? Thank you so much for the question. It's a very highly relevant one. Uh, and someone that I have some a question that I have very strong opinions for, noting the activities of Starlink, and noting that local communities and emerging markets want to develop their capabilities without having large organizations like Starlink taking away from their ability to do so. What we see currently is non-governmental entities taking advantage of the regulatory lacuna. It's very shameful that the multilateral system, by no fault of theirs, is too slow to keep up with industry development. So what we see now is a lot of companies rushing to be the first movers, which they're no longer the first movers, it's now the everyone movers. I see space becoming ungovernable. I certainly see space becoming a capitalist domain that we will become more a reactive Policy making peoples rather than a proactive. We will get to the point where we'll have to create law so urgently that it will not be sustainable at, at some point. And that is why, even like uh, with regards to AI, I was quite impressed by uh, Elon Musk, at least, for calling out that they needed to stop the development of AI versions and AI capabilities until we had policies in place. And that's something I wish we had done for space as well. Industry is moving far too quickly. And when you have uh, very influential industries like Starlink, it pushes smaller entities out of the way. What I see happening in the future, I see the conglomeration of, what can I call it, uh, consortia. So I see states and organizations grouping together into parties and I see it becoming this party against this party. And I see Africa becoming one of those critical, I would say, um, the determining points for geopolitical strategy, noting that both, both the US and China have a very large competing interest in Africa, and as well will have large and competing interest in other areas and so will other regions, et cetera. Whatever we see expressed on earth will likely be expressed in space as well. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Um, is there any other uh, question? So if there is not, uh, I would like to uh, ask something uh, last. Um, how easy is uh, for a woman to access uh, space industry uh, nowadays? Yeah, uh, it's not very. <laughs> it's not very easy. Um, I think I'll say so in the sense that we've gone past not having opportunities. I think there are a lot of opportunities. I think we're now going more to institutional barriers to space. I won't lie. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of gender bias against women in this industry. It's a lot of uh, instance, and I'm sorry to bring up a sensitive topic: sexual harassment. There's a lot of undermining of women's voices. And uh, even more so if you come from, you know, minority group of women, you know, uh, black from previously disadvantaged communities as well, it's quite difficult. But nevertheless, I think there's still a very big opportunity to grow from the women's networks that are currently existing. It's still very much a men's world. I'll give you the example of uh, when I started my career in 20. When did I start? In 2019. <laughs> when I started my career in 2019, I then attended my first conference in 2020. 
I was, uh, of course, one of the few women, but I was the only black person in the entire conference. So that was quite weird <laughs> for me. Uh, but you'll find when you go for conferences as well, uh, you'll find yourself maybe two, three women, you know, it's, it's sort of like that. And that's something that you have to learn to adapt to. It's not nice, but once you assert yourself, I've had calls with gentlemen where I have to be very clear that I, I have more to offer. You know, I am very stern, very uh, knowledgeable. Um, and I also don't need male validation or male support or rallying around me. I can assert myself because then you also have instances where perhaps someone wants to, it's support, but wants to take away from your autonomy. It's, it's doable, it's getting better now, but be wary of all of that, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I can see Ms. Antonia Karadamaki. She's also a member of uh, Space Generation Advis Advisory Council. Yes, hello. Thank you very Antonia. much for your presentation. I don't know if you have uh, the opportunity to watch uh, the whole lecture. I, am, uh, I was at work, <laughs> okay. to be honest, but... Uh, we covered it. Yeah, stop. <laughs> but if there is something we would like to ask, uh, you can go now. Uh, and Miss Nanai Karamesini also from the past year. Uh, Mr. Kavalambos, Sir Yu has one uh, question for you. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, very interesting talk. Just like to ask about the African uh, Space Union. I have seen this, uh, let's say, initiative, if you can call it like, is it possible to function? Uh, because as far as I know, Africa is not a union like European Union or, or USA. So what's the future of this union? Just another initiative that is going to do in years. Yes. Uh... Funny enough, <laughs> my counterpart from SJC Greece asked me the same question. The AU does not function, unfortunately, the same way as the EU. I think this is for reasons of the number of countries. I think the existing corruption that exists in Africa and the existing, I think, administrative challenges. I will tell you quite frankly that for the African Space Agency, the singular reason why it hasn't come about right now is because they are not able to agree on who is going to lead. Simply that, who's going to be the director, who's going to lead this initiative, et cetera. So if, if at the EU there are these kinds of arguments, with 55 countries, it's even more difficult. Also owing to the fact that unions are have a contributional element, which is you get as much as you contribute and always the ones who contribute more and the ones who contribute less do not always benefit the same. We have the challenge of not having the contribution capacity to begin with. We also have the challenge of not having the enforcement capabilities, which is a general theme in space law. There is no way to determine if you default, what are the actual tangible rules. As an African who's especially proud about uh, our continent. I'm really sad that there is no way to really coordinate what is a resource-rich continent towards development. Corruption in Africa is a theme that is continuously paining us. So to that end, the viability of some of the initiatives, I will say as an independent researcher and as a member of the youth, it's like you, you just fulfill a mandate for the sake of it, but it doesn't have any practical input for application. We'll see how that goes. I may be a bit critical on that, but uh, insofar as the African Union, I'll give the example of the massive human rights challenges that have taken place, uh, especially in West Africa, where the only sanction for the countries that made those offenses was to just exclude them from future meetings. That's the kind of policy we have there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, Rubimbo, we would like to thank you very much for your uh, lecture. 
and um, for answering uh, all of our questions. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here today with us, and we hope uh, to continue further uh, the cooperation on space uh, issues. Um, so thank you very much for joining. Yes, thank you so much. I hope, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I didn't expect to get sick. <laughs> I was fine when we chatted last week. Uh, but in any case, I've sent the presentation. It has my email. It has my LinkedIn. If you have any questions, I'll also link you to Nicholas as well, who will support you further. But let's chat and all the best. Okay. Now I've, I've checked that uh, uh, Nicholas was uh, already on my uh, list in uh, LinkedIn, so it's okay. Tell him I sent you because it's the reason I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presence here. And uh, we'd like to thank you all uh, for attending uh, this course uh, during uh, this uh, semester. Uh, it was our pleasure to have you here in our uh, master program. Uh, I would like to wish you good luck uh, with your exams. Uh, it won't be so difficult. Um, alumni uh, could uh, reaffirm that, such as Andonia, Urania. Um, so I hope to see you in the summer school uh, during uh, July. May the force be with you. Bye.